Hey, I just got a notice on my, we're going to need to close our door in case we want up the folks coming through. Just got a notice on my phone that we are live now on live stream. And uh, I don't know if we have anybody going to join us today uh, live, but uh, if you are joining us live, we welcome you in Jesus' name. Uh, this is our weekly Bible study. We conduct Bible study here in Dallas every single Tuesday evening at 7.30 Central Standard Time. And uh, we invite you, we're going to try real hard to broadcast on Sunday and Tuesday. So those of you that are outside of our immediate area will be able to join us for Bible study on uh, Tuesday evenings. And this week we are beginning uh, a very serious look at the book of James. I think y'all are going to enjoy this. This is going to be very good. And uh, uh, we're going to go through the entire book. And however long it takes us, it takes us. Uh, I'm not one to rush. I don't like to... I, I'd rather get all the goodness and all the material out of it we can get. James is an extremely important book. Uh, there's a lot of controversy in theological circles concerning the book of James and whether or not some even try to argue that it not, ought not to be contained in the canon of Scripture and uh, because it was not written by one of the original twelve. And... Uh, but it was written by the Lord's brother. <laughs> and, and he fulfills all of the requirements of an apostle. He was an eyewitness to the Lord's resurrection. And uh, he was sent by the Lord to minister. We know when the Lord sent the apostles out uh, that he sent out over 70. That there were not just 12 that were sent. The term apostle literally means sent. One who is sent. And uh, we know that the Lord himself physically, verbally sent more than simply the twelve. And James most certainly um, is one of those. that. So he qualifies in many regards as an apostle, although he is not immediately directly identified as an apostle. The apostle James, the, the actual apostle by the name of James, and we're going to go into this momentarily, uh, but he was martyred, as we know, from the book of Acts, from our walk through the book of Acts. And uh, James, the brother of Jesus, um, was not an immediate follower of the Lord, but he came to be a believer. He came to follow the Lord later in life, and he became a very important figure in the early Christian church. And as you're going to see momentarily, he had the full support and endorsement of the apostles. And uh, so anyhow, we're going, to get all, we're going to get into all that in just a moment. Uh, I want us to remember as we begin our Bible study with prayer today, we have a dear friend uh, up in Tennessee, I believe it is. And uh, she is... Teresa is not feeling well. She has not been feeling well for a couple of days. And uh, she thought earlier today that she was feeling better, but then she had to go do some things, and she said that uh, she really was scared because she didn't. She almost didn't feel like she was going to make it home. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, I just think the enemy is coming against her body and working against her. I said, well, honey, we're going to be praying for you tonight. So we want to remember Teresa tonight as we pray. And uh, if any of you out there are watching, you know you have the ability to make comments on live stream. And if you have any prayer requests or special needs on Sunday or Tuesday that you'd like us to remember, please uh, get on as quickly as you can, as, you know, even before we... Uh, really get started, get on there and post your prayer requests and your needs so we can include them in our prayer time here on Tuesday nights. Okay, if we bow our heads, let's open with a word of prayer. Master, we love you today, God, and we thank you for this opportunity once again to be in this place. We thank you, Lord, for the word of God, which is the bread of life for us today. Master, as we would delve into your word to retrieve from it the nourishment, the guidance, the direction, the wisdom 
the knowledge that you would have us to glean. We ask God that your divine presence and your anointing would rest upon us in this place. Anoint the teacher, anoint the students, anoint all that would hear by reason of the internet. Lord, that we might glean every truth and every nugget of gold that you would desire we glean today. Master today, let your word come alive to us. Grant revelation of the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. For we ask it, God and none other, than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. We're, this week, at least, we're going to do an overview of the book before we go into the verse-by-verse -verse, uh, breakdown. Uh, but we're going to start out with the author. Who is this man, James, the author uh, of the biblical book of James? The author identifies himself as James in the very first verse of the very first chapter. He was probably the brother of Jesus and leader of the Jerusalem Council, as we read in Acts 15 when we did our Bible study through the book of Acts. Four men in the New Testament have this same name, James. The author of this letter could not have been the Apostle James. Uh, he died too early approximately A.D. 44, to have written it. The other two men named James had neither the stature nor the influence that the writer of this letter had. James was one of several brothers of the Lord Jesus Christ, probably the oldest since he heads the list in Matthew 13, verse 55. And we know that it was common uh, when writing a list of... Uh, of siblings or family member, you always would start at the eldest and work your way down. And therefore, the fact that he's at the top of the list indicates he was probably the first child Mary gave birth to after Jesus was born. So he is probably the very first uh, half-brother that Jesus had. And uh, uh, so that, I would imagine that would have created quite an interesting relationship between he and the Lord. Later, James, uh, let me, at first, James did not believe in Jesus and even challenged him and misunderstood his mission, as we read in John chapter 7, verses 2 through 5. But later, he became very prominent in the church. His prominence in the church is manifested in these ways. He was one of the select individuals the Lord appeared to after his resurrection. We know this is testified by the Apostle Paul to his first letter to the Corinthians in chapter 15 and verse 7. The Apostle Paul referred to him as a pillar of the church in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 9. On his first uh, post-conversion visit to Jerusalem, uh, Paul and James met. They got together and met, and we read of this in Galatians 1 verse 19. Paul also did the same on his last visit, as we read about in Acts chapter uh, 21 and verse 18. When Peter was rescued from prison, he told his friends to tell James. Remember? He said, go and tell James. See, see why our Bible study walk through the book of Acts was so important? And it was so imperative that we do that first. Yes. Because there's so much interplay between the epistles and the uh, book of Acts, the history. So uh, when Peter was rescued from prison by the angel, he told his friends to tell James in Acts 12, verse 17. James was a leader in the important council at Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15 and verse 13. And again, we, we read that and we studied that. And the role that James played at that time was extremely important because, in fact, he's the one who drafted the position. What, how should the uh, New Testament believers who were not Jews, how then should they respond to the law? What part of the law, if any, should they adopt and make a part of their own life? And it was James who drafted uh, as it were, the response, and the entire church, including every one of the standing apostles, 
agreed and accepted the position that James had recommended. So obviously this is a man who uh, was very well thought of within, the, within apostolic circles. Okay? And uh, in Jude could identify himself simply as a brother of James. In Jude 1 verse 1, so well known was James. In other words, James was so well known in the church world that his brother Jude simply had to say, I'm a brother of James. And everybody would immediately say, oh, okay, I know who that is. Because James was so well known and again, so well thought of and held with such high esteem. Uh, this man, James, was martyred in approximately A.D. 62. So he also, with the apostles, lost his life for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, it is so important to understand that the apostles were given the responsibility and the right to establish the foundation of the early church. But you've got to understand, they were not the only characters. They were not the only people who were involved in this process. Now, if James had stepped out of order, if James had something to say that was completely contrary to everything the gospel uh, held true, then you can know that Paul or Peter or one of the uh, other apostles uh, would have chastised him, rebuked him, or mentioned him in one of their epistles. If there were some writing that James put forth that contradicted anything they believed or they accepted or they endorsed, they would have made it abundantly clear. Hey folks, steer clear of what you've read that James wrote you. Especially when you understand, we're, we're going to look at the time frame of the writing of James. This is very important as well. Uh, the date, some date the letter of James, the epistle of James, uh, to the early 60s, meaning, of course, to, you know, the first part of the, what they would refer to as uh, 60 AD, okay? Uh, and there are indications, however, that it was written before AD 50. This is important to understand, uh, if, if you go down to the bottom of this slide, you'll see, and I'm, I'm going to kind of jump ahead a little bit. If this early dating is correct, this letter is the earliest of all the New Testament writings with the possible exception of Galatians. Say, well, why would that be important? Because that is how we know that if there were any issue with what James wrote, this is one of the first epistles to be published. In the church. If there were any problem with this, there was plenty of time in the later writings of Peter, Paul, John, so on and so forth. There was plenty of time for them to refute it. There was plenty of time for them to rebuke, to chastise, to uh, bring to light, whatever you might want to say, okay? Uh, because it is commonly believed by scholars that this is absolutely one of the earliest epistles written if not the earliest. Uh, the only one that possibly, it, we believe probably was written maybe <laughs> before him, uh, before James, is the Galatians, Paul's letter to the Galatian church. Now, in trying to understand why we think that uh, his letter may have been written before uh, 50 AD, it is distinctively J Jewish in nature, which suggests that it was composed when the church was still predominantly Jewish. Mm -hmm. See, this whole epistle of James has a very Jewish tenor to it. Mm -hmm. And this suggests that James wrote it before very many Gentiles had come into the faith, before there was a great Gentile influence in the church. And of course, we know from our walk through the book of Acts that almost the, the first half of the book of Acts, the Jews were dominant in the early Christian church. And uh, 
So that this is one thing that serves as a clue. It reflects a simple church order. Officers of the church are called simply elders in James chapter 5 and verse 14 and teachers in James chapter 3 and verse 1. Uh, the more complex structure of church government had not yet quite taken form. Paul had not yet articulated that God had given us some apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Do you follow? All James refers to is elders and teachers. So in, it's likely based on the way he wrote and the way he approached things that his writing was before 50 AD. No reference is made to the controversy over Gentile circumcision. And this, of course, is the controversy that he wound up playing an enormous role in responding to. So again, if that issue had already been addressed, it would almost, it would almost just, you'd almost be certain that James would refer to it in his epistle. All right, but he makes no mention of it. So there's a good probability that this issue had not yet even yet been raised. The Greek term synagogue, uh, which simply means meeting, is used to designate the meeting or the meeting place of the church, as we read in James chapter 2 and verse 2. So again, this speaks to the very Jewish tenor, the very Jewish nature of James' writing. So it's very probable that he wrote before 50 A.D., and as I say, we know that the Apostle James now had already been dead by that time for at least a few years. Okay? Uh, so that's how we know that this is most likely the brother of Jesus, and it was written somewhere before roughly 50 AD. The recipients of the book are clearly and explicitly identified in chapter 1, verse 1. The... Uh, James says, the twelve tribes scattered among the nations. This is who he addresses in his writing. Some hold that this expression refers to Christians in general, but the term twelve tribes would more naturally and theologically accurately uh, speak to Jewish Christians. Furthermore, a Jewish audience would be more in keeping with the obviously Jewish nature of the letter. The use of the Hebrew title for God, Kyrios Sabaoth, Lord Almighty, is seen in uh, chapter 5, verse 4. Uh, that the recipients were Christian is clear from chapter 2, verse 1, as well as chapter 5, verses 7 through 8. This is one issue that, that I take with people all the time. Because so many people go into the New Testament, especially uh, into the epistles, and they pull stuff completely out of context in terms of, uh, if you're going to understand this material accurately, you've got to know who's being written to. Mm -hmm. If I say something to a believer, and I say something to an unbeliever, it's, it's going to have a very different connotation. Mm -hmm. If I say to a believer, you, if you're going to be saved, you've got to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. That means one thing, if I'm speaking to a believer. If I say to an unbeliever, if you will be saved, you have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm saying something entirely different. That's right. You follow. And you lose the harmony of the gospel. You lose the harmony that's found in the apostolic message. But there is no loss of harmony because these epistles are all written to believers. Nobody is writing to unbelievers. And when you understand that, you then understand much of what you read, much of what you see, much of what you hear dif differently. Excuse me. It has been plausibly suggested that these were believers from the early Jerusalem church who after Stephen's death were scattered as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Syrian Antioch. 
Remember Acts chapter 8 verse 1 as well as Acts 11 and verse 19. You remember how the early church, when the persecution began at Jerusalem, how many of the people began to scatter. They began to go out into other parts of Asia and Asia Minor. And uh, so what it has been suggested that James is probably writing, who were those people? Jews. They were believing Jews, what we would call today Messianic Jews. They were scattered abroad, so what is more probable is that James is addressing those Jewish believers who have been scattered because of the persecution, okay? This would account for James' references to trials and oppression, his intimate knowledge of the readers, and the authoritative nature of the letter. As leader of the Jerusalem church, James wrote as a pastor to instruct and encourage his dispersed people in the face of their difficulties. So James knew these people he was writing to, even though they were in a variety of different locations, even though they were scattered all about. He knew these people. He had worked with them. He had known them. He had pastored them. And he was continuing to serve uh, them as an instructor. Okay? Now, the distinctive characteristics of the book of James. Every epistle, every book, every author has a certain distinction as to their style and, and the way they write and the way they approach things. Uh, the characteristics that make the letter of James distinctive are, number one, its unmistakably Jewish nature. The book of James is very... Now, how many people even know this? How many Christians even think about that? Nobody. They read it, and they read it the same way they read Romans. They read it the same way they read 1 Corinthians, which is written to Gentiles. Mm -hmm. See, understanding these things, folks, it changes the entire way you understand what is written. Mm -hmm. If you don't get this, then you're going to miss a lot of important truths in what James writes. For instance, when we get into James chapter 2, and he begins to talk about faith without works is dead, being alone. He's writing to a Jewish audience. But he's not writing about the works of the law. He's writing about works as in action. He's simply saying to them, Faith without action is dead. Faith without action means nothing. And so he's addressing the concept of action. He is not addressing the concept of the works of the law. He is not telling them that you must obey the Jewish uh, uh, law and you, know, you have to follow the edicts of Moses. It's not what he's saying. That's not what he articulates. He's trying to actually draw those people away from that to help them understand because if you have faith in Christ it pulls you away from the law it doesn't draw you closer to it it pulls you away from the law and he's saying if you have faith in Christ then your actions should support that Therefore, you would not be relying upon circumcision. You would not be relying upon the uh, edicts of the law mm -hmm. to bring about your salvation. No, you know better than that. If you really believe what we preach and teach, then your, your actions are going to support that. And that's true of any believer, Jew or Gentile. If you really believe the message, then your actions must support what you claim to believe. Because confession with the mouth is not sufficient in and of itself. Uh -huh. It is not. Because I preached a couple weeks ago, talk is cheap. You can say, oh, I believe in Jesus. I love people get up in award shows and talk about, you know, I thank God for helping me be so successful. I thank God for uh, my Lord Jesus Christ for helping me be, you know, and then they get out there and they sing songs with the F word peppered all through it and they talk about screwing this one and that one and they talk about messing around with this woman, that woman, this cat, this dog, 
And, you know, they, they speak of all kinds of perversion and all kinds of ungodliness and all kinds of uh, hedonism. And, folks, that's completely contradictory to anything that is godly and righteous and holy. Amen. And yet they confess they know God. Amen. So confession with the mouth is not sufficient in and of itself. Your actions have to back it up. All right. Right. <laughs> so I'm getting ahead of myself. We're not. <clears throat> but I'm trying to help us understand why it is so important to understand the context and to understand the distinctive characteristics uh, that accompany any given epistle. All right. So it's unmistakably Jewish in nature. It's emphasis, number two, on vital Christianity, which is characterized by good deeds and a faith that works, or a faith that is accompanied by action. And this includes a consistent godly lifestyle. Consistent godly life. Not a, not a godly lifestyle Sunday and then a heathen lifestyle Monday through Saturday. Three, one of the other distinctive characteristics of the book of James is its simple organization. It's very, very simply organized. Four, its familiarity with Jesus' teachings preserved in the Sermon on the Mount. For instance, if you look at James chapter 2 and verse 5 and compare that to the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 verses 3, as well as uh, Matthew chapter 3, verses 10 through 12, and Matthew chapter 7, 15 through 20, and Matthew chapter 3, verse 18, uh, or excuse me, James chapter 3, verse 18, you can compare with Matthew 5 and 9, Matthew 5, 2 through 3. Um, I keep, no, I keep, I keep jumbling here. James 3, 18, you can compare with Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. James chapter 5, verses 2 through 3, you can compare with Matthew 6, 19 and 20. James chapter 5, verse 12, you can compare to Matthew 5, 33 through 37. So in other words, James is very much, what he is teaching is very much, obviously he is very, very, very aware of what Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount. Because his teaching is in direct correlation with everything the Lord said in the Sermon on the Mount. Okay? He's enhancing, as it were. He's expounding on the Lord's Sermon on the Mount. Five, uh, the book of James' similarity to Old Testament wisdom writings, such as the book of Proverbs. And then number six, it's excellent Greek. This is, this is not a book that was written by an ignoramus. This man was very intelligent. He obviously had some sort of education. He knew the language of the day. Jews speak Hebrew. Okay. However, at this time in history, under the uh, rule of the Roman Empire, the language of the day that was most commonly used for communication whether that be uh, letters and teaching and what have you, was Greek. And this is what James used in his writing, the book of James. He used Greek, okay? And he used excellent Greek. So that shows you. Uh, now, this is a man that was very intelligent, very intellectual, uh, had some kind of teaching and some sort of background. A basic outline, I'm not going to go through this entire outline, uh, but this is the outline that I'm using for the Bible study. So as we go through, this will be the outline that I follow. Okay? Now, what we're going to do, yeah, I think we might have time to at least start then looking at uh, chapter 1. Okay, chapter 1, we begin with his greeting. This is how we know who James is addressing. James said, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. So I said, uh, it's probably he is speaking to those Jewish believers 
who started out in Jerusalem, but because of persecution, had to scatter. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, when James wrote this letter, it is likely that he did not send it to one location. It probably was copied and sent to several locations at one time. Again, the likelihood that the apostles have seen this letter is very high. Because again, this is not one letter going to one location. This is a letter that is being written for uh, broad circulation, as it were. And therefore, we know that Paul traveled to the places where the early Jewish believers had scattered to, where they were starting congregations. So, J he, Paul probably read James' letter before he wrote most of his. Mm -hmm. And if there were an issue to be addressed, you can bet Paul would have addressed it. He was not at all shy in that regard. But we read, as we talked about in our overview, that Paul held James in very high esteem. He writes of James. He speaks of James. Twice he meets with James when he comes into Jerusalem. So there, there appears to be no conflict with the apostles' belief system, with their teaching, with the foundation they've laid for the church, and what James has written to the Jewish believers that have been scattered. All right. Trials and temptations. James writes of trials and temptations in verses 2 through 18 of chapter 1. And he begins in verses 2 through 12 talking about the testing of our faith. He writes, My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Boy, I could teach on this for probably an hour. Just these, just these three verses right here. First of all, we read the word temptations. Most people, when you read the word temptation, we look at it in terms of the enemy holding something pretty and shiny out in front of you. That is not what Paul, uh, what James is talking about. He's not talking about temptation. The word, the King James translators use the word temptation because at their time in history, the term temptation had a very different uh, connotation, very different meaning. He's talking about trials. He's talking about tribulations. He's not talking about something pretty and shiny. He's talking about the exact opposite. When things are really going bad, and things are really hard, and it's really difficult, and you're, going, you're suffering, and you're struggling. He said, count it all joy when you fall into divers, to a variety of trials and tribulations. He said, knowing this, that the trying of your faith, See? So obviously holding a pretty shiny little apple out in front of you is not what he's talking about. He's talking about trials and tribulation. He said, the trying of your faith worketh patience. The end result of the trying of your faith is patience. People wonder why God doesn't do for me the minute I ask Him. Why does the Lord make me keep asking? Why does the Lord make me have to keep holding in there and keep believing over a long period of time or over whatever period of time? Because it is through the trial of your faith that patience is birthed. You cannot possibly get to patience without the trying of your faith. It doesn't work that way. People love the idea of shortcuts. Oh, how many times do people say, Oh, God, give me patience. Right? Isn't that a common phrase we hear all the time? Oh, Lord, give me patience. Why? Because we just want God to hand it to us on a silver platter. We want to wake up one morning and just have patience. It doesn't work that way. Let me tell you, children, the last thing in the world you want to ask God for is patience. Amen. <laughs> The last thing in the world you want to ask God for is patience, unless you're a doctor. <laughs> because when you ask for patience, you are inviting tribulation. 
Because that is the road you must travel if you are to acquire patience. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. Do you follow? But look what he says further in verse 4. He said, but let patience have her perfect work that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If there is any verse in the Greek translated by the New Testament, uh, by the King James and various other translators, if there's any word that has been misunderstood, misquoted, mistranslated, misrepresented over the last 2,000 years, it's this word right here. Perfect. How many times, holiness person, has a preacher stood up in front of you and quoted the passage which says, Be ye perfect, even as I am perfect. Well, honey, if you could be as perfect as God, you wouldn't need Jesus. If you could be as perfect as God, you wouldn't need salvation. Grace would be an exercise in futility if perfection at that degree and at that level were possible. That is not what this term means. The term perfect that you read here today, and it literally means, like Jack just said, it means complete. I mean, God wants to do an entire work in you. God wants to do something with you and bring it to full fruition and completion. And James says, listen, these trials and these temptations and these struggles, that's all part of God's plan to get you where God wants you to be. Said, so, But let patience have her complete work. Let patience do what God is trying to allow it to do in your life. Let it bring your, your life to fullness and completion in what God is trying to do. That ye may be complete and entire. You see those two words... <laughs> Work right hand in hand. They work right in tandem with one another, don't they? So that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. I've heard the old saying, patience is a virtue. Honey, I'm going to tell you, if there's anything this preacher needs, but Lord, I'm not asking you for it. Just give me wisdom, which you say you'll give freely. And... Uh, but patience is one of the most wonderful gifts that it is one of the most wonderful virtues that you could ever possibly possess. You find somebody that has that divine God-inspired patience. They've been through the trials. They've been through the struggles. They've been through the tribulations. And they know how to wait on God. Oh, I got to tell you, just this week I had to sit and listen to somebody barking and complaining about how they couldn't possibly see how God could meet their needs so they could get into their new apartment and blah, blah, blah. I'm going to tell you, that wears me out like this. That, that garbage, that's what it is, garbage, wears me out like this. You want to turn me off so fast? I may not have all the patience in the world, but honey, I've been through some things in my life and I guarantee you, I can wait on God a little bit longer than that. Uh -huh. I can give God more time than here we are a month to go before that need even needs to be met. And this person is already signing it off. Mm -hmm. You hear me? Mm -hmm. I'll at least get to a day or two before i got to pay the money. <laughs> 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 I can at least wait that long. <laughs> you follow what I'm trying to say? It, when you live this life and when you live for God and when you go through the trials and you've been through the fire and God has provided and come through for you over and over and over and over again, honey, let me tell you, it becomes easier to wait on God. Amen. It becomes easier to say, let's see what the Lord will do. When I was lying in a hospital bed in New Haven, Connecticut, dying with pneumonia, and my aunt is serving as my medical proxy, 
And the doctors come to her and say, he's been on life support now for about th almost three weeks and we need to put in a tracheotomy so that the life support can be more permanent. Because uh, if by any miracle he were to recover, his voice box will be destroyed and he, he'll not hardly be able to talk. Because we don't put life support down somebody's throat for more than a week if we can help it and two weeks at the top. And he's already been three weeks. And my aunt said, I didn't know what to say. I didn't know how to respond. She said, I, I immediately I thought, well, wait a minute, I'm not answering for me. I'm answering for Chuck. I'm answering for my nephew. She said, and all of a sudden, I found these words flying out of my mouth. Said, I, didn't, I, I know it was God. I know it's what you would have said. She said, I heard myself say, well, let's just wait and see what God does first. Because even though the doctors were panicked, even though the doctors were troubled, even though the doctors were worried, honey, God wasn't worried. I wasn't worried. We're going to leave it in God's hands. We can wait on God. Amen. Hallelujah. Uh -huh. Woo. Ooh, I'm going to shout a little. I'm telling you folks, if you're watching on the internet, uh, our Bible studies get pretty happy, so get ready. Sometimes we want to sprout wings and fly. Let page, uh, let faith work its perfect course. You know, let it accomplish all, everything that God is trying to do. You don't know what you'll be able to believe God for tomorrow that you couldn't believe Him for today. Uh -huh. Hallelujah. I talk all the time about what I call the faith muscle. Without resistance, you do not build muscle. If you go to a gym and all you do is push an empty bar up in the air that has no weights on it, you're going to benefit very little. The more resistance, the harder it is to push up that weight, then the better your body responds and the more powerfully your body responds. And before too long, you've got muscles where you didn't even know you had muscles. Now, don't be looking at me and trying to figure out that illustration. All right. We all know I don't live no weights, except for a turkey leg and a fork. But do you follow the idea? Will you follow what I'm trying to tell you? And this is why Jesus said to that little lady who came to him, that little Samaritan woman whose daughter was grievously vexed with the devil, this is why the Lord said, I've not come but for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. This is why he kept pushing her away. This is why he said it's not good to cast the children's food to the dogs. This is why he said this. Was he trying to push her away? Was he trying to force her out? Was he trying to deny her a miracle? No! He was forcing her to push against the resistance to fight through the trial, uh -huh. to fight through the hardship, Amen. to fight through where it sounded like God was saying no. Amen. Mm -hmm. Because it's in that perseverance that her faith prevailed. And the Lord turns around and said, I haven't found faith like this in all of Israel. Hallelujah, lady. Good for you. Good for you. You didn't let what I was saying cause you to turn around in defeat. We've got people today call themselves Christian. And honey, they go to the Lord one time in prayer. And ask for something, and if God don't drop it out of heaven on their head, uh -huh. they turn around like a crybaby and go home whining and bawling that God didn't do for them what God wanted them to do. My Lord, have mercy. Ooh, the preacher going to tell it today. <laughs> Let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be Complete, perfect, and entire. Wanting nothing. Honey, if you can learn to wait on God, guess what? When it's all over, you ain't going to lack for nothing. Amen. That's the truth. You ain't going to lack for nothing. God help us. My word. Ooh, I want to shout a little. <laughs> Let's keep going. If any of you lack wisdom... Let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally 
and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. I think I'll stop and tell you. I'll stop and tell you. I talk about this all the time. People want God to do for them. People want God to do for them. People want God to do for them because they keep putting themselves in bad situations because they do not use wisdom. And then they wonder why the Lord doesn't do. Because, honey, you keep digging yourself into a hole. If God bails you out right now, you're going to turn around and tomorrow you'll be in the same bloody hole you just got out of because you don't operate in wisdom. Got people in the church right now always griping. I better clarify this. I don't want anybody to get hurt feelings. Nobody in this room. Always griping. They don't have money. They don't have resources. They can't do this. They can't do that. And I know for a fact it's because, not because they don't have sufficient, because they don't use a lick of wisdom with what they do have. And they whiz through it in 10 minutes when if they utilize wisdom, they easily could make that work for themselves. So what James is telling the believers is, listen to this now, this is, this is important. He's talking about patience and how faith and patience work together. But then look at his very next statement. He said, oh, but first, honey, you better be operating in wisdom. Before you start looking to God to bail you out of a hole all the time, you better make sure you're functioning wisely. Hello now. My Lord, have mercy. And then the wonderful part of it is, this, this is the great part. Patience comes through tribulation and trial, but wisdom is freely given. James says, if you lack wisdom, ask God. He gives everybody liberally. And He won't take it back. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> My Lord, have mercy. Woo! I mean, I don't know about you over there at home if you're shouting or not, but you ought to be. Woo! Say, brother, my money just don't go as far as it ought to. Ask God for wisdom. You'd be surprised what God can help you with. That's right. uh -huh. You'd be surprised how the Lord can help you make $500, $600, $800 a month. Honey, I got new. Oh, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> Ooh, I'm going to tell you. The Lord can have you living like a king simply through wisdom. Yes. Uh -huh. It's wise to shop thrift shops rather than Lord and Taylor. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> uh -huh. It's wise. Listen to me now. I'm going to say something to y'all that's going to surprise y'all. I'm not going to get up here and say, it's wise to shop Walmart instead of Sears. No, that ain't wise. It's wise to buy quality this is a lesson my father taught me when I was young. He didn't teach me a whole lot of good, but he taught me one thing that I appreciate to this day. He said, if you buy good stuff the first time, you will not have to keep replacing it over and over and over again. I got news for you. My closet is full of all kind of uh, brand names. I got all kind of good looking clothes up in my closet. I had an entire, until I got too fat for it, I had an entire closet full of about a dozen suits that all come from Hager. Beautiful action suits, they call them. They're made uh, in such a way, boy, that you can wear them and wear them and wear them and they don't wear out, you know. Guess where I got them? Thrift shop. Every one of them got from a thrift shop. Um, I don't wear thrift shop clothes. Well, that's why you always broke, you fool. <laughs> I don't buy store brands. Well, that's why you always broke. I know somebody who gets a limited income, limited amount of money every month. And I gave this person a planter, a nice molded plastic planter that kind of looked like an urn type thing, you know, with a base on it. They were real pretty and everything. 
For her to put some plant in, she wanted to plant. You know what she did? She went out and bought her an earth-friendly, green-friendly model. Well, it costs more money, but it's better for the environment. Hey, donkey. The one I gave you, I don't care if it causes the end of the world. It didn't cost you nothing. <laughs> now, do you see where there's complete, I won't say it, stupidity and lack of wisdom? This person went out and bought something that I gave them for free. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because they're worried about the ecology. They're worried about the planet. That's wisdom. No, that's not wisdom. That's foolishness. Because mm -hmm. I got news for you. The one I gave her is still going to be in the junkyard for the next 10,000 years. You follow? Yeah. By going out and buying the other model, you didn't do nothing to alleviate the one I gave you. That's right. Mm -hmm. So what you did was completely foolish and a waste of your resources. And then this will be the very person who runs to the church every single week, every single month. I need help. I need help. You need help, all right. You don't need more money because you don't know what to do with the money you got. What you need is wisdom. And I'm going to tell you, I believe this promise is as, oh, I believe this promise is real as I believe any promise in the Word of God concerning wisdom. This is as real to me as God's promise to heal. Amen. When I was a young man, my grandmother, we had a pastor. When I was a kid, we had a pastor who was all of like 28, 29 years old. Young guy. Brother Richard Babcock. I loved him. I thought he was terrific. <laughs> we used to have a wonderful move of God under him. Ooh, we had, our church was on fire, man. I mean, to tell you, it was exciting. And I loved Brother Babcock. But my grandmother, who could find fault with Jesus, used to constantly say, Ah, oh, he lacks wisdom. He lacks wisdom. She, she found fault with everything he ever wanted to do. And her excuse, her reasoning was always, he lacks wisdom. He lacks wisdom. So, when the Lord called me to preach at the age of eight years old, sitting in the pew of that Pentecostal church, watching Brother Babcock preach, that's when the Lord called me. I was literally watching Brother Babcock preach. And... When the Lord called me to preach, and I'm getting a little bit older, you know, I kept hearing my grandma over and over, he lacks wisdom, he lacks wisdom, he lacks wisdom. I grabbed hold of this promise from God, and I said, Lord, give me wisdom. I don't want to be one of them young preachers that some old lady sitting in the congregation constantly saying, he lacks wisdom, he lacks wisdom, he lacks wisdom. Started my first church when I was just about to exit my teens. And I had situations arise in my church, folks, that if I were to tell you the details, I'm going to curl your hair, even yours, Jack. <laughs> Jack would have this big curly beard, you know, like Santa Claus. But I mean, I had some situations, folks, that I mean really heavy duty. And here I was, 19 years old. And God would help me to respond to these situations in such a way, I didn't lose a church member. We didn't never have a single church split. We didn't have all kinds of, uh, of uh, discord and things going on. God would show me. I just it was in me to know how to respond to it, because God honors His word. If any man lack like wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth liberally to all men. God had given me. How do I know? I'll tell you how I know. Not because I think so highly of myself. Don't misunderstand me. But let me tell you how I know. Because my overseer in the church of God, my local overseer was brother, uh, uh, he was the same man I did my internship under in the church of God, brother Carver. And one day, he and I were having a discussion <laughs> about one of these situations that arose. It was a biggie. Tell you, a lady in the church fell in love with me when she was married. And the devil was trying 
to, to drive them out of our church and then add, add to the misery of it all, she told her husband, Oh, brother, he wanted out of our church so fast you had it spin. He didn't want to be there anymore. If his wife was looking at the preacher with desire and have an affection for him, he didn't want to be in that church anymore. He was ready. He wasn't going to come back ever. And I was a young single man, 19 years old. And she came to me with one of the ladies in the church like I taught my people. Because I was a single preacher. I said, ladies, if you have to come to me, to counsel with me, I'm happy to counsel with you, but do not come alone. You either bring your husband or bring a lady in the church that you have confidence in, and you know. So, but do not come to me alone because I will not go off into a room with you by myself. Hmm. That's wisdom. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's, right. That's wisdom. She came to me with Connie, an older lady in the church who had been in Pentecost for many, many years, told me what was going on. And I responded and I told her, I said, well, I said, Sue, honey, uh, I don't have any desire for you in that regard whatsoever. It ain't going to happen. <laughs> I can tell you that right off the cuff. I said, but let me tell you what else is going on. God's got a plan for y'all here. And the enemy's trying to plant this in your spirit. I said, this ain't nothing but a thing. This is just the devil trying to distract your family and get you out of this church because this is where God wants you to be. I said, now here's what you need to do. I said, you go back home to your husband and you tell him exactly what I'm telling you right now. Sister Connie and I went to the pastor. We spoke to him about this. I told him what I was feeling and what was going on in my head. This is what he said. This is just the enemy. We're going to get over this. It ain't going to happen. There ain't nothing to worry about. Ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -ba. She did exactly what I told her to do. The next Sunday, she and her husband were back in the church. And when this preacher retired, resigned that church sometime later and left and came back to Texas, guess who wound up pastoring that very church? This family. Do you see what the enemy was trying to do? Do you see how the enemy was trying to put off track what God was trying to do? You see, I was 19 years old. Brother Carver, when he and I had a conversation about this, Brother Carver said to me, he said, Chuck, I know preachers in their 50s who've been preaching for 30 years. And if they had to face a situation like this, it would have knocked them right off their feet. They, they'd have messed it all up. They have said all the wrong things. They have done all the wrong things. And it would have blown up and become a mess. He said, son, God has given you a mighty powerful dose of wisdom. That's it. Because I asked. Because I asked. Say, how can I do better with my money? How can I do better with my life? How can I make better choices and better decisions? How can I be more prosperous? How can I advance in my, you know, T.D. Jakes and get up in the pulpit and preach people happy, telling them how God wants them to be prosperous and God wants them to succeed. And I believe all those things. <clears throat> what I don't believe is the road a lot of these preachers tell them to get on. Right. Let me tell you the road you need to travel is a little road called wisdom. Amen. And God will pave that highway for you so that you can't make a misstep if you ask it. Uh -huh. We are always to pray for wisdom. I still, every time I pray, every time I pray, listen to me sometimes. Listen to me sometimes. See if you don't hear me say, God, give me wisdom. Especially if you're going to pastor. God, give me wisdom. Like old Solomon. Lord, give me wisdom and understanding that I might lead your people well. That's my desire. I can't do it. Whoo! Whoo! <laughs> You can't do it. You can't do the work of God without wisdom and understanding. And wisdom breeds understanding. My little lady, nine-year-old great-grandmother, bless her heart, when I came out in 1989, that lady never said one crooked word to me. She did not ever say one negative thing. She loved me the same she did before I came out. Never, not one time did she ever say anything even remotely derogatory or nasty. Now my grandmother, her daughter, my mother's mother, 
She couldn't open her mouth without saying something stupid. Without saying something hurtful. Without saying something that would push me further and further out. It's already backslidden away from God. And boy, she made sure she kept me as far away from God as she could keep me. And I watched my grandfather sit there and shake his head. Oh, my whole life I watched my grandfather sit there and shake his head. Every time she'd open her mouth, something stupid would fly out. I watched this, and I knew what it was. This woman had no wisdom whatsoever. None. None. Zero, zilch, nada, nothing. In my entire life, I watched my grandmother. I've got family that write me on Facebook, cousins and extended family, and they tell me how they hated to be around my grandmother. They hated, this is their aunt, or their great aunt, you know. They hated to be around her. They hated to be near her because she always made them feel unworthy of God. They all, she always made them feel undeserving. She always made them feel like a failure. She always made them feel like they weren't good enough. Folks, that is the byproduct of a lack of wisdom. Because wisdom will allow you to speak word. The Bible tells us a word fitly spoken. Is as apples of gold. And I'm going to tell you, the word of God, the wisdom of God, excuse me, will cause you and allow you to speak the right thing at the right time. And let me tell you what else it'll do. It'll help you to keep your big bloody mouth shut when you need to shut. Amen. The biggest part of wisdom isn't the right answer. The biggest part of wisdom is when not to give an answer. When to just hold your peace. I go through this all the time with some people. And I say, see right there, you just needed to let it go. Just stop it right there. Don't go a step further. Just drop it right there. Well, I love you. If you ever need me, I'm there for you. You're done with it. Don't keep going. Don't keep trying. Because no. all you're going to do is breed contempt. That person's going to hate to see you coming. Don't do it. And I try to help people see wisdom. I try to help them see. And I get people, I've had people tear out of our church and call me a cult leader and a wicked one and a this and a that and all kind of stuff because I tried to share wisdom with them. And you know what? To this day, i got news for you. What I tried to tell them was wisdom then and it's wisdom now and I don't apologize for it. It was the right answer at the right time. And it proved to be so. And it did prove to be so. You know, folks, I'm not up here. I don't get, I don't get a bonus if somehow or another, you know, I, the way some people like to tell it, you know, you're trying to control their life. You're trying... What do I get out of that? What do I do? Does the Lord send me a thousand dollar bonus because you're under my mind control? You know, no. I haven't gotten paid in 19 years for the work that I do in the ministry. I'm not doing this for money. I'm not doing this for popularity. If you ask me a question sincerely, uh, desiring a sincere answer, I'm going to give you a sincere answer whether you like it or not. But I guarantee you the answer that I give you is for your betterment and not for your destruction. I'm not trying to see you tear yourself up. I'm trying to see your life benefited and healthy and prosperous and accomplishing what God wants to accomplish in your life. Wisdom. I love this passage. Amen. I love this passage. That's why I'm spending so much time on it. Oh, this is such a wonderful truth today, folks. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God that, that giveth liberally to all men. What does that mean? That means wisdom is not like a gift of the Spirit where it's at God's discretion who gets what gifts. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? Wisdom is not at God's discretion. He said, if you'll ask, I'll give. Period. To all men. 
Anybody that asks, okay, you're an unbeliever, you can still ask God for wisdom and He'll give it to you. You're not a Christian, you can still ask. If you've got enough faith in your heart to believe God's real and God exists, you can ask Him for wisdom and He'll give it to you. But now let's try to finish up so we can close up by 9 o'clock. An hour and a half is a good lengthy session. Verse 6, but let him ask in faith nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. Oh my Lord have mercy. Well there's the problem with a lot of people's faith. Yeah, they ask God. But they got all kinds of other little things fluttering around in their brain. I talked about this Sunday a little bit. See, that's the enemy's job. He wants to keep you on the waves. He wants to keep you tossing. He wants to keep you doubting. He wants to keep a question in your mind as to whether or not God will heal you, whether or not God wants to heal you, whether or not you qualify for healing. And as long as he can keep you teeter-tottering like that, guess what? You ain't going to get nothing. That's right. You ain't going to get nothing. How do I know that? Look at verse 7. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. <laughs> My Lord, have mercy. <laughs> I, I don't think I can add too much to that. I think James says it about as well as you can say it. And he finishes in verse 8. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. I hate to use my grandmother as an example, but I'm telling you, I grew up with her and. I used to about go insane because we'd go to church and my preacher would get up there and preach faith in God and preach trust in the Lord and preach all this. And my grandmother would come along and I never knew a woman in my life that had as little faith and as little wisdom as that lady had. I'm serious. I'm being honest as a heart Used to drive me insane. I can't stand to be around faithless people. I'm going to be honest with you. I cannot stand it. If you wonder why, I don't spend a lot of time in certain people's company. It don't mean they're nasty, you know, ugly people. It don't mean they're evil, wicked people. But it might mean that they're faithless people who are constantly down mouths, who are constantly talking the negative, who are constantly talking the obstacle rather than the victory through faith in God. And my grandmother was that way. Constantly, brother. Oh, Lord Almighty. And she would label it, I'm just being realistic. That was her favorite phrase. And I was, you know, God called me to preach and people think on Facebook, ah, oh, he's so mean, you know. He, he says things so direct and so straightforward. Honey, I did it with my own family. I told my grandma, I said, you are not being realistic. You're being faithless. Oh, I'm going to say something now. I'm going to get ahead of myself on a sermon. I'm going to be preaching down the road with. this. I'm going to say it now, though. Honey, if you can't believe God to feed your fat face today, mm. I don't know how in the world you think you're going to believe God to take you to heaven when you're dying. Wow. Okay. That's right. Mm. My Lord, have mercy. Mm -hmm. My grandmother went to her grave literally writhing and virtually screaming in fear. That is not the way a believer goes to their reward. Here her little grandson is, pastor in a church that she used to love to just tell folks so they could pity her. Because after all, the work I'm doing is such a hideous, horrible, evil work that when she'd tell people about it, you know, oh Lord, bless poor sister Eleanor. Her grandson is pastor in a church for a bunch of homos and queers. And yet, when I was facing my death in 2000, I had doctors, I had nurses, I had psychiatrists and psychologists that came into my room and sat with me and said, I have never seen anybody. That's what they told me. More than one, way more than one. I've never seen anybody had such peace when they are rocking 
on the edge of death and life. I've never seen anybody that was as calm and as peaceful and as self-assured as you are. And my answer was, the Word of God said for me to live as Christ, to die is gain. I don't preach this, I believe it. Mm -hmm. I said, if I didn't believe it, there'd be no sense in me preaching it. If I didn't believe it, I wouldn't serve God another day of my life. Honey, if you cannot learn to believe God for the little things in the here and now, how in the world can you believe God concerning the unseen hereafter? Preach it, brother. Lord have mercy. Preach it. Am I telling it? How are you going to do it? How are you going to believe hell's hot and heaven's real? You're saved by grace and God is ready to welcome you to your reward. How are you genuinely going to know your spirit? With conviction. When the hour of your passing arrives. And you're looking into the face of the spirit of death. How in the world are you going to know that. If you cannot even believe God in this life. To meet the most basic of your needs. How are you going to know. And un a double minded man is unstable in all his ways. Honey, if you can't believe God concerning life, i got news for you. You're going to have a devil of a time believing God concerning death. Mm -hmm. If you can't believe God concerning the here and now, you're going to have a dickens of a time believing God concerning the hereafter. Do you follow what I'm trying to tell you? You're unstable in all your ways. Every aspect of your faith is going to be shaky. There's no such thing as having rock-solid faith in this area and shaky faith in this area. That's what they tried to suggest about my grandma when she was dying. And my aunt said, you know, oh, she's terrified. She's so scared. She wakes up sweating. She's terrified. She's scared to death. And I sat there and I thought to myself, you cannot have rock-solid faith in life and have shaky faith concerning death. That's right. It don't work that way. Faith is faith. If your faith is established, if you're standing on the rock, Jesus said, if you build on what I tell you, if you build on what I teach and tell you, you're like a man that builds on a rock. Honey, a rock don't shake. That's right. It don't move. Double-minded man's unstable in all his ways. That's why it's so important, friends. That's why people, people think this preacher's so mean. I'm just so awful and terrible. I'm going to tell you, I get people in our church. I've been pastoring for almost 30 years. Jordan, people come into the church that refuse, refuse to adopt a lifestyle of faith. Listen, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Honey, you cannot come to this church without developing your faith. Amen. Unless, uh-oh, unless you reject the Word of God. That's right. So when I get somebody that comes into a church I'm pastoring, and I know I preach faith, I didn't say I preach prosperity, I said I preach uh -huh. faith. Amen. Amen. And I see them year after year after year, brother, living a lifestyle of fear and unbelief. God help me for what I'm going to say. Hope it's wisdom. If the master of the vineyard comes through and says, it's time to weed, I think I'll pull this one up out of here. My response is, goodbye and good riddance. Because i got news for you. The children of Israel lost out with God. Not because every one of them were filled with fear and unbelief but because they allowed those that had fear and unbelief to thrive in the midst of them. Uh -huh. That's good teaching. My Lord have mercy. People good wonder teaching. why this preacher. You wonder why I, I, I well, on Facebook, if somebody acts the fool, I have to go, okay, delete. I'm finished. Well, brother, if you were more godly, you'd spend more time trying to get them. And blah, 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 blah. Nope. 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 Let me tell you something. I know what can poison my spirit. I know what can dilute my faith. 
I know what can come against my confidence in God. And I won't let that garbage in my head for one minute. The minute you want to start coming at me, haven't you read the Leviticus, dirty? <laughs> <laughs> Don't you know Romans 1, dirty? <laughs> You're gone, bye. It is not my job to help you understand why I have confidence in God and why I believe I'm saved and why I believe I can face my death with certainty and assurity and why I'm not afraid of the rapture and why I'm excited about Jesus coming. It ain't my job to explain myself to you. See, you're not part of the equation. You're not part of the relationship I have with King Jesus. Last I looked, you weren't even mentioned. So if people think, Jordan, they're going to come pollute my spirit and plan all this negativity, ain't going to happen. Bye-bye. See you around. When you really get saved, call me. Well, hey, I can add you as a friend again. It's not impossible. Uh-huh. Once you really pray through to a relationship with God, once you really find out what grace is, create a new profile and then come talk to me. Because as long as you're on the old one, you won't be able to find me. All right. <laughs> Trying to get through this, <laughs> this first part. This is good. James continues to say, Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low. Because as the flower of the grass, he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways." And then, and you, now you notice in James' progression here, mm -hmm. he's talking about faith and wisdom. Mm -hmm. He's talking about wisdom, and now he is going into where we place our confidence. Mm -hmm. If you got a stick of wisdom in your brain, you know better than to have confidence in your banking account. That's right. You know better than to have confidence in your job. You know better than to have confidence in your investments. You know better than to have confidence in Wall Street. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know how many believers? I read posts on Facebook and online all the time. You know how many believers voice things that clearly speak to me, Jack? That their confidence is in Wall Street, their confidence is in their bank book, their confidence is in Obama, or their confidence is in Romney, or their confidence is in the FDIC. Hello now. And James says, folks, I got news for you. When the sun is at its highest, which is when the flower is most benefited, he said, at that very exact same moment, that sun begins to work against the flower uh -huh. to cause it to fade, to cause it to dry up, and to cause it to die. Mm. There's a cycle. There's a circle. At your most advantageous moment, at your best moment, you're at the beginning of your worst. Because mm -hmm. when you get to the highest height you can get to, they know where to go, as the old saying goes, but down. Right. And that's what James is saying. Uh -huh. He's saying, honey, you think you're so slick? Because you're this big, bright, beautiful flower. He said, well, when the sun gets to its highest point, when you think everything's the best it'll ever be, watch out, because that same sun that's helping you today is going to hurt you tomorrow. Because there's a cycle. And anybody that has wisdom, anybody that knows God and understands God and understands His creation knows that that's how it works. My word have mercy. I'll, I'll let that be all I say on this, okay? <laughs> so I can move on. Alright. We will start next week with the source of temptation or trials and tribulations, okay? Okay. Uh, 
But uh, we'll go ahead and put that off for next week. But I hope y'all got, are you getting something out of this? Oh, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I told you, I told you there'd be some real good material here. Mm -hmm. And uh, James is a wonderful book. It, it is an incredible book. It offers insights that I believe no other book in the Bible offers. Uh, it helps to articulate some truths that are, that are spoken of elsewhere, but never so poignantly and so perfectly just James just lays it out in such but you know it's like we were discussing about the uh, about the book of James you know one of the things about James is just the simplicity of it so he don't mince a lot of words he don't get up there and just go off into these ramblings I hate to say it but Paul was a talker <laughs> he was sometimes Paul I'm gonna tell you sometimes that man if you really read what he wrote he didn't always just say what he was saying. He'd go off in this woo circle, and you know, and you feel like you're on a Ferris wheel for two or three turns. Then finally, you'd get back to where where he was talking about. Uh, I, you go into Romans, Paul talked about the things that I would not, I do not, and the evil that I would not do, I do, and the good that I would not, I do. You know, <laughs> sweetheart, there's a whole lot easier way to say that. There's a whole lot easier way to say that. But Paul was kind of wordy. He, he had this an eloquence, but, but he, he tried to say things, you know, in a certain way. There are preachers I know who are far more eloquent than me. And I love to listen to them preach. C.M. Ward used to be one of those. The way that man could tell, the way he preached, the way he described things, the, whoo, it, was, it was beautiful. I can't even explain how he... He, he'd paint an image in your mind that just came to life. And it would be so eloquent, so beautifully expressed. I don't do that. It's not my nature. I'm more, this is what it is, take it or leave it, like it or lump it, ba ba da boom <laughs> And James and I are in agreement because James is much more that way. He, he's much more direct. He's much more simplified in his approach. He says what he's trying to say. And this is why he just flows from one thought right to the next, you know? He doesn't spend a whole chapter blowing wind about this and, you know, carrying on about that. So anyway, next week we will begin at verse number 12 and we'll continue from there. But, uh, ooh, I feel the Holy Ghost. Oh, yes. Amen. I love the Word of God. Amen. I love the Word of God. 